closing up my, my last question and question I'd like to ask all my guests is what in your view is in today's world, the single most valuable idea? That it's all good. There's a reason for everything. And it's good. So relax. <laughs> and that's, that's one of the best ones yet. Simple, but very <laughs> profound in some sense. Really excited for this one. So the following is a conversation with David Allen, an American author and productivity consultant, best known for creating the Getting Things Done methodology, or GTD. This revolutionary system has empowered countless individuals and organizations reach new heights of productivity and efficiency. Through a career that has spanned a diverse range of professions David has distilled his rich experiences to a methodology that teaches us how to capture, clarify, and organize our tasks and projects. His contributions have transformed the way we approach work and life, offering clarity to us amongst the chaos. Beyond his seminal books, David's influence extends through seminars, workshops, and training programs, making him a pivotal figure in the realm of productivity and organizational management. And now, dear friends, here's David Allen. All right, awesome. Again, a, an honor to have you here, sir. Um, so I was wondering if we could start off in Louisiana and how your hometown's culture and environment helped influence your early interests and, and values. Well, <laughs> um, I had a nice childhood and, and my dad died when I was, when I was young, I was, I was only nine. Uh, and so my mom pretty much raised me and she saw I had a knack for presenting, you know, I memorized uh, Bugs Bunny albums when I was five or six years old and I would come, you know, present them for people in the in the living room. And so she then gave me acting lessons is to see sort of a in in you know I grew up in Shreveport, which at the time had two uh, actually very good community theaters. And uh I took acting lessons and it turns out that I then got a I became sort of the child actor in in town so i did a lot of of well not that many but i was lewis in the king and i uh i was uh, I, I played john and peter pan i was uh i was the kid in waiting for godot i was so you know i had uh an awe wilderness too so i i had a, a bunch of acting experience, which was, which was fabulous. I mean, you can't, you can't beat that as a, as a way to, to the, and I, I'm actually a, a bit of a closet introvert. I, I, you know, a lot of what, what I look like I do looks kind of extroverted, but in truth, um, I'm really more of an introvert. So those were great opportunities for me to kind of stand out and express myself and find out. And then, um, you know, I got in, as I got into high school, I started, I got into debate. And so, uh, you know, I was a state champion debater. So that taught me a lot about extemporaneous speaking and, you know, and, and doing that. And, you know, what else in, in my early life? culture oh well uh in my high school there was an exchange student from germany and i i met her and it sort of gave me the idea well would it kind of be cool to see if i could be an exchange student so at the time uh there was something called afs american field service which 
which at the time, most of the U.S. exchange students went for the summer to sort of live with a, a foreign family for just two or three months in the summer. But there were a few of us who were willing to say, I'll go for a year. But at the time, it was a bit challenging to find families around the world who would be willing to, to, to take an American kid for a year and be responsible for them and, and do all that. But turns out I was able to find a family that was interested in taking me on. So I, I between my junior and senior year in high school, I spent a year in Zurich with the Swiss family. And, you know, that would sort of broaden my, uh, my horizons a lot. Uh, you know, I, I, the, the school I went to, it wasn't an academic program. It was really more of a social program just to live with the family. And then you went to whatever school that the kids in the family went to. Well, it turns out that the kids in this family went to Real Gymnasium Zürichberg, which is, you know, probably one of the top uh, prep high schools for the university in Europe. <laughs> so, uh, and I... Uh, Anyway, so I went to school there. I I didn't have any German. I hadn't, you know, I just had to, as fast as I could, try to learn as much German as I could so I could try to understand at least a little bit of what was going on. The weird thing was in Switzerland, even though they speak high German, Hochdeutsch, in school, as soon as the bell rings, they all speak Tutti Deutsch or, or, you know, Swiss German which is a whole different language. So I had these sort of two different languages that I was trying to navigate and so forth. Anyway, so that was quite an experience. And the school itself was only two blocks from the Kunsthaus in Zurich, where I would walk down, have a beer, and sit in a room with all the Monet water lilies around me. You know, it's like, oh my God. You know, so suddenly I... I had an experience of culture uh, and certainly European culture. Uh, you know, and I was only a few blocks from uh, the Cafe Odeon, which is where Dadaism started and where where Jung, you know, uh, spends time. And so I had an experience of sort of, wow, sort of expanded my world a ton. I also uh, had a a, a, a sister. She was actually a half sister. My dad had been married before he'd married my mom. They'd had a daughter. So I knew Shirley sort of considered her a sister, but she was much older than me. But she had married one of the top um, writers in the 1950s, uh, uh, John Clellan Holmes. And they were all friends with. Kerouac and Ginsburg and whatever. So uh, I had a chance to also visit them when I was nine or 10 or 11 years old, but I had a chance to get an experience of a whole world out there, the whole beat world. You know, uh, Shirley's husband and Kerouac coined the term beat because they'd seen a kid walk down you know, the street in New York, like that. And so you know, those were all experiences which sort of broadened my horizons for sure. Sweet. And of course, keep in mind, Daniel, this was the 19, I graduated, you know, in 60, 63, 64 from high school, segregated high school. You know, I didn't... Uh, didn't even connect with uh, with black people at all, you know. In my in my youth, though, I loved the music, I loved the uh, the food. <laughs> you know, th th there was a whole lot of the culture that I really liked. But anyway, uh, at some point, I realized I wanted to get out of the South. Uh, I needed to go somewhere else. Uh, so I wound up, 
uh, in high school, sort of being recruited by this new college. Uh, it was called New College in Sarasota, in Florida. Uh, no grades, design your own education. Um, so that's where I went to to college. And so anyway, that that's sort of a short version of a very long story, Daniel, but I, I'm not sure what else you might want to know about any of that. But yeah, so it's, I, mean, I love the fact that you got there. I was actually going to ask about New College and then having moved to, to UC Berkeley and studying history. I'm wondering how some of that stuff sort of shaped your perspective on, on productivity and, and organizations. Not at all. <laughs> I would, I, I, I just wanted to find out who I was, you know, come on, this is Berkeley 1968. So this is like, you know, personal growth, you know, Valhalla. This is like, Oh my God, you know, let me, let me experiment with, you know, and I'd done a lot of drugs and whatever, just more not to escape, but more to explore. Uh, so I was really interested in, okay, what are all these other aspects of of life I can't see, but that seem to be influencing everybody's life? So, uh, you know, and I was an American intellectual history major in Berkeley in, in graduate school. At some point I said, you know, uh, instead of studying people who were enlightened, let me go get my own. So I dropped out. <laughs> so I, I went, okay, screw it. Let me just go f find out who I was. So that's when I, you know, I did a lot of exploration of various gurus, spiritual practices, meditation practices, got a black belt in karate, you know, and, and martial arts. All that was more to explore for myself. But they don't, they don't pay people to do that. <laughs> and Rice Bowl and Cave was not my inclination quite frankly uh you know i like good looking women and chardonnay and you know good food and so forth so uh i said okay well I, in order to afford that i have to I have to pay the rent so uh, I, I still didn't know what i wanted to do when i grew up i was just into my personal exploration but i had the, i there were people in the network that i that i knew who had their own little businesses they were starting up or whatever. And I became a really good number two guy. So I helped a number of my friends. I would just walk in and say, you know, they needed some help to try to figure out their, what they were doing. And, and, you know, I was a good number two guy. So I showed up and looked at what they were doing. And I said, wait a minute, how can we do this a lot easier? Cause I'm Mr. Lazy, you know, Daniel, come on, you, you, you have met, many people any any lazier than me. So I would just walk in and look at what they were doing and say, well, how can we do this a little bit easier? And, uh, you know, I worked on their, now they call that process improvement. Basically, I was just like, how can we get out of here earlier? <laughs> so, I have, and then I'd fix it. I helped them improve their processes, then I get bored. So then I go, help somebody else with their business. Then I discovered one day, they actually call people something who do that. They pay them, consult them. Oh my God. Okay. <laughs> I guess maybe let's see if I can then uh, sort of pay my way in life simply by doing project by project or working with people to see if I can help improve them. And that was, when was that? 19... 1982, 83. I haven't stopped. So that was kind of it. But at the same time, because of my spiritual practices and explorations and meditation and martial arts, I discovered how valuable it was to have a clear head. You know, if you're jumped by four people in a dark alley, you don't want to have 2,000 unprocessed emails hanging in your psyche. Right? So... I said, okay, well, as my life actually started to get more complex and, you know, I was becoming at least minor league successful. I said, well, how can I, and I said, how can I stay clear? And so I started uncovering these techniques and practices 
that help me stay highly focused. Now, again, I have absolutely no traditional formal education in business psychology or time management. All of my stuff was street smarts. Okay, what's the best way that I can stay clear, stay focused or whatever? And so I started to piece together. I didn't wake up one morning with what this later became GTD or the whole getting things done methodology. It was like little piece by piece. As I say, it was a string of epiphanets. Oh, that worked. Okay, that worked and that worked. And then with my consulting practice, I started to use the techniques for my consulting clients and it produced the same results for them. Hey, if you do these things, you're clear, you've got more space, you can think more strategically, you can be more creative, whatever. So, And it worked for them too. So that's kind of how I got into that game. And then what really catapulted me into that game, some senior guy in a big corporation saw what I was doing. And he said, David, we need that whole result in our whole corporate culture. Can you design some sort of training or seminar around what you've come up with that we can then implement? So I did that. We did a pilot program for a, a thousand executives and managers at Lockheed in California in 1983-84 and it was totally successful you could have fooled me I went mean, suddenly I was thrust into the corporate training world now if you told me as an American intellectual history major in Berkeley in 68 that I was going to be in the corporate training world I said come on what what are you smoking you know <laughs> are you kidding you know? <laughs> but it turned out that was the ripest audience for what I'd come up with they were willing to pay for what I was doing. So that started the sort of trajectory, if you will, of the next 20 years where I trained thousands of people in the corporate world, mostly by referral. I didn't do any marketing. I just picked up the phone. Somebody said, hey, I heard you do this kind of thing. Can you come into our company and do that? So uh, I that that's how I wound up, I suppose, trying to figure out. But Daniel, it took me... 20 years to figure out what I'd figured out and that it was unique and that nobody else seemed to have done it and that it was bulletproof. Anybody started to implement these techniques, uh, gave them more space, more clarity, more ability to focus on strategic stuff. You know, it's, it's so who knew it's yeah. you mentioned um, that you sort of transitioned sort of between 35 different jobs before the age of 35. I'm guessing that's sort of in this process of exploration that you were in, um, trying sort of different things. I'm wondering how valuable do you think something like that is? Because I you just mentioned how important it was for you to find. I think it was a huge waste of time unless you don't know what you're doing and, <laughs> and, and you need the job. That's what I did. I don't know that any of those things, you know, specifically helped with what I ultimately came up with other than just giving me more experience you know, out there in kind of in the world. But I don't I don't know that any of those, Daniel, were key elements. You know, they were things I, I had to figure out kind of by myself what were the things that really worked for me, you know, after all those jobs. And it was kind of nice, you know, to have a lot of experiences, you know, to help a guy run a, a car restoration business in L.A., you know, I learned how to I learned how to fix brakes on a car. I like, you know, I I I I worked with a friend who was doing uh, construction work. I learned what goes inside of walls. <laughs> I worked with another friend who had a uh, who was setting up satellites at the time when they were just getting good and and setting up TVs, big TVs, and and digital world was just coming to life. So all those were, uh, I guess, interesting and fun in retrospect. Nice to have had all those experiences. So, so I wasn't afraid of what was inside of a wall or what was inside of a car. <laughs> you know? So those were, those were nice. But I'm not sure that there was any content there, Daniel, that, that affected, you know, ultimately what I came up with later on. Right. And I think it's just valuable to go through that process of exploration to an extent, um, perhaps not spend as much time as you did, as you said, but 
at least at least going through sort of the process of trying to figure out you know is this something that I'd like to do is that something that I'd like to do um, and at least trying it I think is, is is perhaps something valuable so you mentioned that this sort of Lockheed contract was pretty pivotal in your career and so I'm wondering up until that point was there any sort of mentor um, or sort of key feet figure that you found that that, that guided your career no not really I had a I had a, a a really good mentor as I started my own consulting practice, somebody I met in my network and uh, I was able to bring him a good client and he had actually figured out quite a number of really, really neat, uh, very valuable things to do in terms of facilitating organizational change. He was really an executive consultant uh, and he had come up with his own model about how to work with an organization to see where it wanted to go and how to facilitate that. So Dean worked with me. Uh, we worked together for a couple of years and he, he essentially said, David, I think you're probably going to take whatever I can share with you much more than I am interested in doing that. So he basically shared with me all of his knowledge and, and his best practices. So yeah. So Dean was a great mentor of mine, still a good friend. Uh, and he taught me how to get stuff out of your head. He taught me how to do all kinds of things that he had come up with as a way to get executives to get clearer about where they were going. And he just found out there was just so much garbage and so much stuff in an organization and in their heads that they were unclear about that was preventing them from being able to be clear about where they wanted to go. So he had uncovered, you know, some of those things. So, you know, two or three of the of the techniques that I wound up doing, I, I learned from Dean. Also, because I was doing a bunch of personal growth trainings and so forth, there was a lot about, uh, about agreements. What happens if you keep an agreement? What happens if you don't keep an agreement? You know, and, and the price you pay. So a whole lot of, ultimately, a lot of what my business then became getting clear about what people's agreements with themselves were. What are the would, could, should, need tos, ought tos that they, that they had made that agreement with themselves. A lot of them included other people, but they were all agreements with themselves. And right. so uh, a, a lot of what I came up with was a, a way to both understand what that was and then to see how to facilitate the, the getting clear you know, for people. Right. So, so diving a little deeper into, into your work, um, you introduced in your amazing book, Getting Things Done, The Art of Stress-Free Productivity, which will, for the audience, be linked down below. Uh, it's an amazing read, uh, particularly the concept of capturing everything you need to work. And I'm so I'm wondering sort of what on a daily basis um, do you capture? If anything pops into my head that I can't finish in a moment. Are there any sort of repeated tasks that you find um, more often than not that you capture? Oh, wow. Anything. I, I just, I keep paper and pen around me, you know, all the time. You know, uh, one of the best tools I've had for 40 years, right here. Pen and paper and critical plastic. Because God knows when lightning strikes out there and you get an idea of something you might want to do, should do, need to remember, need to do something about. So I just learned that years ago. Now the cognitive scientists have basically validated the fact that the, the number of things you can actually keep just in your head and still remember, remind, prioritize, and manage a relationship is four, four things. But I just discovered years ago, nothing. Sticks, sticks in my head. Now, again, I'm 78, Daniel. I still have to do this. I still have to remind myself, come on, David, why have that thought more than once? You teach this stuff, write it down, get it out of your head. Come on. Because it's a big habit for most people to change. Huge. Right. Right. But it's, it's super important. I think I've, I found it personally useful every time I take notes on something and sort of allows me to contextualize it within my own sort of mental understanding of a subject. Um, and so you also- Oh yeah, yeah. It's not just a static process. It's actually a, quite a creative process. Yeah. Yeah. 
Uh, and so you also mentioned sort of this need to do a weekly review. Um, and so I'm wondering how sort of practicing that has, has influenced your, your own work habits. I don't know when I discovered that, but, you know, it was somewhere along the line. I realized that at least once a week I need to catch up, you know, bring up the rear guard. Because anybody listening or watching this right now has had stuff happen in the last few days that they haven't had time to figure out what's the project I'm committed to complete about this. What do I need to do about this right now? And when are you going to do that? That actually is a required thinking process. And it's pretty, that's, that's a huge habit for anybody to implement. So it's the biggest thing that gets in the way of most people implementing, getting things done in the methodology is the lack of that regular reflection review time to catch up and clean up. And again, that's not a static process. That's actually quite a creative process. Right. Right. And so I think another one of your, I find that very interesting. Another one of your sort of core principles in the book is um, understanding and determining your next actions. So I'm wondering what sort of what process you undergo personally in, in determining what to do next. And do you have sort of, you know, ranges? Right. Of yeah. Yeah. It, 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 it's very simple and it's very hard. It's called think. <laughs> it is very hard and simple. I agree think wait a minute what am i going to do about this look i just got something in the mail from come into amsterdam what the hell is this so me and google translate are good friends now but i have to figure that out and i have to decide what do i need to do if anything about this All right so that doesn't this doesn't show up saying david you need to do this I have to figure that out. Same is true with emails. Same is true with anything. Very few things show up that tell you, hey, Daniel, here's the very next thing you need to do about this thing that just landed in your email or just landed in your mailbox. You have to do that. Right? So figuring out the next action, very, very powerful uh, mental muscle to develop. Right. You know, one of the things that I, I sort of personally struggle with is determining what short term actions are best suited to achieve a long term objective. Um, and it's it's always diff I always find it difficult to sort of align the two. And I'm wondering if you have any sort of um, processes for something like that. Yeah, relax. Let's go. <laughs> What's the very next thing I need to do to move the needle on this thing? See, most people think long term means never. As opposed to long term simply means you've got something to commit to. What are you going to do this afternoon that's going to move the needle toward this thing you want to accomplish? It may not be the right thing, live and learn, but you need to get moving. Right. 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 No, that's, that's, that's very. You, so, you know, you know, come on. The key to productivity is outcome and action. What am I trying to accomplish? And how do I then allocate or reallocate my resources to make that happen? So outcome and action are the zeros and ones, essentially, of productivity. So if you have some sort of an outcome, I don't care if that's this afternoon or 20 years from now, then, okay, what would you need to do to start to move toward that? Now, you may decide, I don't want to move on that right now. Great. When would you like to be reminded that you might want to move on it? <laughs> so you, you could say, hmm, I think a year from now, I'll put a trigger in my somewhere and see if I'm ready to move on that. So all those are fine. It's just you just need to decide what is your own agreement with yourself about this thing. Right. And quite frankly, I can't, I've spent thousands of hours with some of the best and brightest people on the planet, making a lot more money than I'll ever see in my life, walking them through that process. Could have fooled me. <laughs> so, so I wrote the book. <laughs> At some point, somebody said, okay, David, you, you probably write, need to write a book about this. I went, how do I, what? 
So I said, okay, well, maybe I'll create a manual out of all the st- things that I've learned in case I got run over by a bus. Somebody could at least pick up the book and, you know, and maybe make it happen. So it turned out that worked. And then, you know, that created a whole new chapter in my life because it's like the book suddenly became a global bestseller, 30 languages translated, you know, 3 million copies out there. So like, who knew? <laughs> so what do we do with that? How do I scale this thing? Because, you know, it didn't need me to produce that value. So how do we, how do I keep a business going and keep supporting myself so I can keep doing this stuff? Anyway, another short version of a very long story, Daniel. <laughs> I'm sure there's many of those in, in an incredible life. Um, so sort of once, once next actions are sort of determined, you, you mentioned that ensuring accountability is extremely important. And so um, I wonder how you would sort of delegate accountability um, and next actions to team members and what methods you think would be best for tracking delegated actions. Well, one of the, probably two of the most, most valuable lists that I had executives create when I was coaching them were agendas and waiting for. So what do I need to talk to somebody about? That's the agenda list. Agenda not meaning a calendar, but agenda meaning here's a list of things to go over with them the next time I see them or talk to them or engage with them. All the things that I need to check on, check status on, handle, hand off to them or whatever. And then a waiting for list. Here's all the things now I'm now waiting for based upon this conversation I just had. Those are huge. (laughs) <laughs> I've had many executives just that changed their whole world. Just those two things, keeping track of what do I need to check with people about, talk to people about, and what are all the things I need to keep track of I'm waiting on to come back from somebody else. So delegate could be anything. could be, hey, Daniel, could you handle that? Great. If you said, yes, I'm going to write that down if I care that you actually produce something. Right? Yeah. Or maybe I just could shoot you an email or, you know, just hold it for a meeting that you and I may have. Whatever. Does that make sense? I mean, this yeah. is, you know, the advanced common sense. <laughs> That's a great way to put it. That this is, um, in some sense, advanced common sense. So you, you sort of mentioned. And now, I, think- I, didn't, I didn't make any of this up, Daniel. I just recognize what happens. I recognize what what you do when things work and objectify them. You know, sometimes it's, especially in the world we live in today, it's, it's pretty difficult to recognize obvious things. And so kudos to you for that. <laughs> <laughs> Yay. Yay. Well, I'm, I'm still doing it. I, I couldn't stop doing this because people ask me, how do I improve my life? And I say, well, what's got your attention about your life? Capture. Step one, what's got your attention? By the way, so what what might you need to do about that? Is there something you need to do about what has your attention? Oh yeah, I guess I forgot, great. And if you can't finish that in two minutes, then we're gonna keep track of that thing that you need to be reminded about. Step three, organize. So capture, clarify, organize. And then, by the way, how often are you looking at where you've written down all these things that you need to be reminded of to see, to feel okay about what you're not doing and what you're doing? Reflect step four. Step five, making trusted choices about what you do or what you don't do. Engage. So, again, that's how you get your kitchen under control if you're having guests over for dinner. That's how you get your life under control. It's just, you know, most people actually don't do that at these more subtle levels. Right. No, no, absolutely. I mean, you, you touched on it a little bit, but I'm wondering if we could sort of linger on it a bit. Um, the need to organize. And you have an interesting sort of conceptual framework around this, which is organizing actions around sort of context and energy level. And, and I'm wondering what that means to you. I found that very interesting. Well, most people have 150 to 220 next actions that they actually are committed to do if they actually sat down and clarified all their agreements for themselves. 
you don't want to see 120 things on a list when you go to the grocery store. You only want to see what I need to do when I'm at the grocery store. Duh. Right. So it's just organizing all the reminders you need to see by where you can do them and when you can do them in what context you can do them. Because you don't want to be overwhelmed by all those things at once. <laughs> Why should you? Yeah. You don't need to because you couldn't do them all at once. You're going out for errands. How about an errands list? All the things you need to do when you're out and about. So, right. again, it's not a difficult concept to understand. Yeah. It's uh, strange that people think that's complex or they think that's too hard. Wow. Okay. I think what's, I what's more difficult is perhaps making it a habit um, and making it a way of life rather than sort of, you know, just something you pick of up. Of course. Yeah. Sure. Sure. But yeah, people aren't born doing this. Yeah. It means it's something you have to learn. You're not born knowing how to cook spaghetti. You're not born knowing how to raise kids. You're not born knowing how to do a whole lot of stuff. Those are things you actually just need to learn. Okay. So how do I keep my head clear and empty when I have a very busy kind of overwhelming kind of life? Something you got to learn. I just figured out the game. Street smarts. <laughs> I'm not a motivational speaker, Daniel. I don't, I don't care in a way. I, I care. Otherwise I wouldn't do this work, but how much of this you do up to you. I just define the game. You can decide how much of the game you want to play. It's a good way to put it. To... <laughs> well, and also part of my job is modeling what it's like. People meet me and they go, God, David, you're nothing like I thought you'd be. <laughs> they thought I was going to be anal and, and anal retentive and buttoned down and corporate or whatever. They say, David, come on, you're a hangout loose guy. I go, yeah, that's how I came up with all this. <laughs> so I could stay that way. Yeah, no, I, that's, I think it's super important to, to see that side. Um, it, it's, it's, it's quite refreshing. So you, you sort of emphasize the importance of informal planning uh, for projects. And I'm wondering what methods and tools you use for sort of back of the envelope style planning. Well, sometimes I use Mind Manager, which is a mind mapping software, you know, my computer. Sometimes I just sit down with a pen and paper and just, you know, draw it out a little bit. It's all I need to do. But again, at this time in my life, I don't have that many really complex projects. Um, I've got a big one coming up, which is my wife wants to do a road trip on the western coast of Norway this summer. So I have to I have to make the decision. Actually, she and I have to make the decision. Is that her project or is this mine? Because <laughs> right. I now have a Tesla Y. And so... We have to need, we need to organize where do you, where can you get these things charged, you know, and we're taking two dogs in the back of the car. So where's pet friendly. So there's, there's a number of things to try to figure out about that. I don't know yet how I'm going to organize. It depends on whether she hands this to me, says, baby, this is yours or she takes it. Uh, if she hands it to me, then I'll probably sit down and do a mind map or something about all the different things we need to look into you know who knows you know that's that's very analogous to sort of complex uh, project management right there um it's, 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 well you need to do what you need to do to get the project off your mind yeah that's right true. some things all you have to do is decide the next action and it's off your mind some things you need a team of six people to sit down for a day and and create a gantt chart on a big wall to figure out to get this project off your mind and anything in between right sounds like you, you have a you have a fun road trip in your future right now um to sort of cap <laughs> we'll see we'll see i don't know she said look david you're 78 she's 65 i think she said look i don't know how many more road trips we're probably going to go on you know we just finished one in spain for five weeks that was uh combination of interesting and stressful <laughs> <laughs> she, 
trying to figure out all that. And, you know, my brand new Tesla is like a four wheel computer. It's like, oh, God. <laughs> trying to, oh, that's how that works. Oh, okay. That's how we do that. Okay. Well, that, that's that's awesome. Spain, Spain's a beautiful place. Um, so sort of, you, you mentioned that capturing ideas when they pop into your head is um, very important. And so um, I'm wondering what tools you use. Is it just Mind Manager? Pen and paper. Pen and paper. Pen and mind paper. Unless I'm at the computer right now, or like I am, and I might be able to then grab something and put it somewhere where it needs to go. But otherwise, I'm just going to write it down. And then <laughs> later on, figure out you know, what to do with it. Right. But I don't want to, I don't want to be distracted while I'm talking to you, Daniel, about anything that may pop into my head while I'm talking to you. So what's the best way to do that? It's called pen and paper. How important? <laughs> Nothing is, better. How important is it, do you think, to sort of capture an idea the instance it arrives in your mind? Versus well, it, depend, it depends on whether you want to be reminded of that idea ever again or whether that was a fleeting muse and you went, okay, I'll find if it shows up again, that's fine. So it depends on whether some part of you says that's something that I might want to be reminded about in some part of the future. Right. I don't write that. Come on. I, you, you have 50,000 thoughts a day. I'm not writing 50,000 things down. Right. Only stuff that pops into my head to go, Oh, Oh, yeah, that reminds me I need or would or could or should. I might want to do something about that, in which case I'll make a note about it. Now, a lot of those notes I just throw away later on and go, God, what a dumb idea, David. You know, toss it. Right. Um, so how has your sort of, how has your own life been affected by your thinking behind productivity? Has it, has it helped benefit you as an individual? I, it's made my living, <laughs> my career. Right. right. And sort of. Right. So, you know, what can I say? I mean, I, I don't know. My, my second choice would be being a waiter in a good French restaurant. <laughs> you know, How bad uh, at all? You no, know, I mean, I, I love being a waiter. You know, I was a, we've often said when we hired people, I said, you know, you actually need to go wait on tables, you know, <laughs> so you can learn how to be observant and not imposing. Anyway, so I, I how does this affect me? I, I just haven't stopped doing this stuff for 40 years, Daniel. You know, I just do it. It's, it's, well, as you've mentioned before, it's it's a habit. It's a lifestyle habit, you know, to make sure, how do I stay clear? You know, wait a minute. What's on my mind, David? And what do I need to do about that? How do I manage that? I'm still, I still have to do that. I still have to do that thinking to try to figure out how to stay clear because I just discovered clarity is fun, nice. Clarity sure sure is fun, and it doesn't make you happy. It makes you satisfied. Yeah, happiness is up and down. Come on, happiness is you know overrated, but satisfaction is a permanent uh, kind of an event. Right. No, I I couldn't agree more. Um. So you you sort of studied productivity methods for over twenty years. That is remarkable. I'm wondering what impediments or distractions you found is the most common barrier for people as they sort of try to become more productive in their own lives. Any of these. People don't write stuff down. They don't clarify the next steps on things that have their attention. They don't organize stuff in places they trust. They don't review and reflect on their stuff as often as they need to. So they are driven by latest and loudest instead of good intuitive strategic decision making. Absolutely. Any one of those could be something that somebody lacks. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, 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 it's a whole package. <laughs> it is a whole package. Yeah. If you do all of that, 
you know, that allows you to stay clear. If you don't, if you miss any one of those pieces, you're not clear. You're driven by latest and loudest. Yeah. So you, you mentioned that sort of preparing for surprises in life is extremely important. And, and I'm wondering what example of a sort of surprising event made a big impact on you. Hmm. Well, I've had quite a lot. The pandemic was one. <laughs> Almost got killed on a sailboat with my wife at the time, or my girlfriend at the time. Was another uh, had a had a Toyota Four Runner uh, catch on fire that driving down the freeway, you know, in L.A. I've had all kinds of surprises. God, I don't know. There, 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 there are a lot of them. And all of those are just about, okay, what's the situation now? And then what do I need to, what, what needs to be true about this? So it's again, outcome and action. So, you know, surprise, you know that's why my second book was called Ready for Anything. <laughs> it's really about how, how do you get ready to engage when you get surprised? So it's coming. Anybody listening or watching this, by the way, is going to get surprised in the next three weeks. <laughs> guarantee, I guarantee you. Surprised with something that is likely going to change your priorities or change what you're thinking about or what you're doing. So how ready are you to integrate the new information and the new situation, make an appropriate decision about what outcome you need to now uh, focus on about that and what's the next step yeah i i think that's one of the hardest things to do at least in my own personal experience this process of dynamically integrating the future changing with your plans in the present um i find to be you know quite challenging in some sense but um no i i agree that it's 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 tremendously useful to sort of plan for plan for surpri surprises so I'm wondering, you, you mentioned. Well, I don't, I, I don't, I plan as little as I can get by with. I don't need that you need to plan for surprise. You need to be ready for it. Yeah. So it's more of a mental thing. Well, it's more like how, how clear can you just stay no matter what's going on? Hmm. And that's true, whether it, it's a surprising event or whether it's just day to day life. So. So it's more of a question of, can you be indifferent to change um, and be be sort of clear, clear of mind? Well, that's kind of the Zen approach is kind of like, okay, <laughs> what's now, what's new, what's up, what do I do? <laughs> right, right. Um, so, so now to sort of transition a little bit, you, you mentioned that when things get confusing, you, you advise to, to shift focus on sort of higher level tasks. Can, can you maybe, if, if possible, share an example of where you found that to be a useful thing to do? Sure. What are you doing with your life? That's a top level. You know, I see these different horizons that I, I identified in terms of our commitments with ourselves. You know, the top level is purpose and principles. What's valuable to you? What matters to you? What are you doing? Who, how, who and how are you? Down to vision about, okay, three to five years from now, what would success look, sound, or feel like lifestyle, career-wise? Down to, okay, what are the things you need to accomplish over the next 24, 12 to 24 months to make sure that, that vision happens? down to, okay, what are the things you need to maintain, like your health and your vitality and your finances and your relationships, down to what are all the projects you need to do about any of that, down to what are all the action steps you need to take about any of the moving parts. I couldn't get it any simpler than that. Yeah. So if you want to get clear about any of that, say, which one of those conversations do you need to, do you need to have with yourself or any other key people in your life? So it's a great way of putting that. Uh, so, you know, moving on to sort of principle 26 on, on setting goals and changing present behavior in your second book, 
I found it really interesting. Um, you say future goals drive present changes in behavior. And I'm thinking, what do you think many people set goals, but don't? why don't they change their day-to-day -day choices to adapt their behavior for those? I don't know. It's just... I have no idea why people don't do that. I go, as again, you know, a goal, the future never happens. I don't know. It's still today. You know, you know it's always today. The future never happens, but it's a very handy illusion to assume how the future might be, because then that affects things you notice today. That's all. So the value of the the value of goals, the value of the future think is how it changes perception and actions today. Period. Yeah. And have you, you found I, I don't know I don't know that I I don't know that I ever had any goals I actually achieved. I probably did. But for the most part, I kind of move towards something. And then I, as I move toward it, I get more mature. I get better data. And I go, oh, God, that's actually what I wanted, not that. So I shift gears to go toward that thing. I never got the first thing I wanted because that actually wasn't as good as this next thing I saw. So that's why getting moving towards stuff is critical, useful, because you'll be, so you'll be smarter, Daniel, tomorrow, probably then, as I will too, than you are today. Right. right. So yeah. that's all, of, that, that, that was my point about the future never happens, but thinking about the future will affect things you perceive today absolutely. and how you perceive them absolutely and i think it's as you said i think it's this process of sort of dynamically adjusting um and there's not really sort of a stringent path that you can follow um so you connect the speed of response to productivity and i'm wondering when coaching a client or or just speaking to an individual that's not a client what techniques have you found most effective for helping individuals and teams In teams? And and either individuals or teams, which, whichever or. Oh, pretty simple. What's got your attention? What are you going to do about it? And that'll dictate your sort of speed of response based off of whatever you're most attentive on. And, and any of that, yeah. No, my new book coming out, you know, in May is taking all the principles that we uncovered in the getting things done methodology and how they apply to teams. If I just walked into a team right now, I don't know, are you on a team, Daniel? Um, yeah, several teams. <laughs> okay. If I walked into any one of those teams right now, I'd say, what's got the team's attention? Right? Because anything that has the team's attention means it's not on cruise control yet. That means there's some decisions that need to be made about it. Some conclusions need to be thought through. Some delegation, some organization or whatever to get that off the team's mind. So if the team is not mind like water, you go, why not? Same principles. No right. difference. So if, if you haven't automated this sort of process, um, I think, is that what you mean by sort of the attention that you're pouring into it? Well, you can't automate this process. It's a thinking process. You can automate the results of the thinking, but not the, the automations is you're not going to trust. Yeah. Yeah. And, and do you think this is a pivotal thing? Because it, it feels like a very pivotal thing in terms of the effectiveness of even you as an individual or especially as a team where you have to coordinate people. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well. Right. right. So, so you sort of, you mentioned that structure and constraints are extremely important, even in a, in a creative process. And sure. personally, as, as I try, I play the guitar sometimes I draw sometimes as I try to be creative, I find that constraints and structure are, um, you know, sort of negative forces. I'm wondering, I'm wondering what you meant by that. 
well, try to paint without paint brushes for a canvas. Yeah, you could go paint on the wall if you want, but uh, try to write something without using a word processor. Good luck. You know, so all of these are constraints. A constraint means, hmm, here's the context within which I need to express. But that context, you could call it constraints. You could, I could just say that it's just your, that's your canvas or that's your, that's your boundaries. That's, that's what you're doing. So, yeah. So constraints, you know, it, there's all kinds of Zen and other people's quotes that say, look, discipline is really being able to constrain yourself appropriately so that you can express yourself appropriately. That, that seems, seems very true in some profound way. Um, so you, you emphasize that- Well, if you never learn the scales on your guitar, you, you're, you're screwed. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no. And if your string breaks, right? <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> yeah, there's no way around those two things. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I think, yeah, like you mentioned, it, it's super important to contextualize those constraints for whatever it is that, that, that you're doing in that moment. Um, yeah, well, I, I, if you really want to go do something, you don't even think constraints. You just go do it within the context of doing it. And then in retrospect, you might say, yeah, I had these constraints. Um, but kind of only in retrospect do you do you think of these things as as limits yeah no that that's 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 really interesting um you you emphasize that that an effective system that even with effective systems to to sort of achieve productivity we still need intuition and I think you, you sort of touched on this a little bit earlier um, to make you know choices about the next best action. I'm wondering what in your experience separates those who develop excellent intuitive decision-making from those who struggle with it? Uh, it could be one of two things. One is, is your brain is still clouded up with all kinds of stuff you haven't managed. So, you know, you can't tell the difference between indigestion and intuition. <laughs> the other is you might need to focus more on your horizons to say, where am I really going? Why am I really doing this? What really matters to me about any of this? Either one of those could constrain your ability to be making intuitive, trusted intuitive choices. Yeah, I think I find those to be really deep things um, and and quite difficult to sort of instill in, in your own life unless you you make them ritualistic in some sense. Oh, there's a simple answer to this, Daniel. It's called get older. <laughs> but you, we, you can't rush that process, though. It's uh, no, I agree. No, but you can trust that process. That's true. That's very true. So. In, in getting older, I guess one of the things that happens is you build sort of small habits that that make big changes. Um, what what's one tiny habit that you'd recommend everyone develop? Write stuff down that's on your head. That's the biggest small habit anybody could do is get it out of your head. Your head is a crappy office. God, I don't know how long. I don't know how. I don't know how long I'm going to have to preach this gospel. Your head can't do it. Your head, to, your head evolved to do very sophisticated stuff. You're doing it right now, which is you're taking long-term history and pattern recognition. Call, oh, that's a computer. That's a David Allen. That's a thing. Yay. You're doing that very well, but you go to the store for lemons. You come back with six things and no lemons. What happened? 
you try to use your head as your office. It's a crappy office. Externalize all that stuff. It's the biggest single habit I could uh, teach people about, as well as trust your heart. Okay, pay attention to truly what's what's up with you really internally. And then you probably need to do some stuff about that so that some part of you doesn't get hung up about it. Yeah, the, the planning for the future, or you know, even planning out your day. If you're not writing down the set of tasks that you plan on doing, and you think that you just remember when to do them and how to do them and why you're doing them, um, is is I think a, a very difficult task and one that you mostly fail at. <laughs> well, you don't have to do any of that. You could do all that down and look at it and go, "No, I'm going to have a beer. I'm going to take a nap. I'm going to go play with the dogs." You just need to know what you're not doing so you feel comfortable about what you're not doing. Right. So sort of another sort of key principle that I that I took away from your third book that I found really interesting was that you, you sort of state that there are only two things that someone needs to achieve, and that's positive and productive engagement. Um, and I'm wondering why you feel like those two things are, are so important. What are those two things? Remind me. Uh, positive and productive engagement. Well, you need to be appropriately engaged with your stuff. Appropriate engagement simply means I've decided what this is. Here's where it goes. Here's what I'm not doing about that right now. And that's fine. So appropriate engagement. Are you appropriately engaged with your health? Are you appropriately engaged with your cat? Are you appropriately engaged with your life partner are you appropriately engaged with your career appropriate engagement simply means i have to decide wait a minute how, what is it how is it what do i need to do about it and park the results in places that you trust i think right. if that's what you refer to that would be my answer yeah no that, that is what I'm, I'm referring to um and sort of stepping back a little but I'm wondering in, in examining the global popularity of GTD uh, which is incredible you note that it sort of appeals to a broad range of cultures and, and personalities um, what what are sort of the typical types of people you encounter do people just walk up to you on the street um, <laughs> you're quite famous now so uh, not that much every once in a while it happens but Usually the people most attracted to what I've come up with are the people who need it the least. They're already the most productive people you'd ever meet. They already know the value of systems. They already know how valuable organizing is. They already know they could create value because they already have. They just have run out of room. <laughs> so that's the cool thing about my life is... <laughs> gotten to connect with some of the coolest people you'd ever meet simply because they get attracted to this for those reasons so, so probably so, like you daniel i'd assume <laughs> i think so come on you already know the value of organization you already know how much value you could create if you had more room to create more of it you already know look that's why you're going oh this is cool stuff very cool stuff um, because I think it's still something that like a lot of people, irrespective of how organized you might think you are, deeply, deeply struggle with um, and sort of the productivity gains it can create for you in your life. If you just make sort of small incremental changes by following a lot of the methods that you've spelled out over the course of your entire work are, are huge. Um, and so I just, I hope mm -hmm. sort of, take that to be a very deep thing. Um, yeah. Well, I've said, you know, small things done in strategic places create major results. And that's the truth. Yeah. By the way, that also works negatively. You do little things that are not that productive 
it's going to create negative results. Yeah, I think it's, it's all about sort of the, the compounding nature of things over time. Um, and, and those small things pay, play a pretty big factor in, in the future. Um, so you sort of identify... They certainly have for me. They certainly have for me, yeah. And I think for anybody who starts to implement this stuff, yeah, in my experience, for sure. So you sort of identify two key functions of um, reflecting, and that's updating information and building perspective. And I'm more curious about the latter. What do you mean by building perspective? Well, why do you have projects on your project list? Building perspective simply says, look, what's my focus? What am I doing? You know, what's important to me? So the perspective are the different horizons that you've got. You know, that that's the perspective aspect of it. Like, so what are you about? You know, give me a list of all the meetings that you're going to and tell me why you're going to them. That's perspective. And and you think it's extremely important to constantly be reevaluating your perspective. No. I'm not a motivational speaker. You decide how important it is. I don't care. That I just define. I just define. Look, here are the different horizons that you might want to be aware of. Yeah, that could help you if you want to be helped. If you don't want to be helped, I don't care. I got more stuff to do. So you're you're trying to play more of the role of here are the facts and do with it as you will. Yeah. Well, right. <laughs> again. I just figured out the game, how <laughs> much you want to play the game, how well you want to play the game. That's your choice. Believe me, I'd have burned out a long time ago if I expected people to play this game. Totally. Very, I think, yeah, that dis distinguishing a motivational speaker from what I think you, you more lean to, which is an academic is, uh, it, this is important. Um, so I'm, I'm sort of wondering, this is where I get to sort of the big picture question. I'm wondering what sort of principles and values you've carried along with you in life, um, that you, that you feel like if young people today adopted more often, um, they'd get further along. Yeah. Pay attention to your intuition, to that still small voice inside of you that kind of knows who you are, what you're doing, loves you terribly and is willing for you to ignore it as long as you want to ignore it, but it's still there. Right. That's, that's probably what I, it, I was in my late twenties, early thirties before I really understood that. So if I had some advice for anybody, I'd say, hmm, start to pay attention to your intuition, whatever you think that is. But there is a still small voice inside of you that says, that's a, that's a good thing. That's not such a good thing. Uh, well, you might want to go here. You might want to go there. Yeah, I think that's incredibly important. It's sort of hard to, to pay attention to that voice in the, um, you know, sort of speed of information. In the noise, yeah. No, no, I get it. That's why I say get as clear as you can be so that some part of you can then start to trust what that still small voice. You know, yeah. that still small voice happens for me usually when I can put the dogs to bed, put my wife to bed, have a glass of wine, sit it late at night, <clears throat> no phone, no nothing, and just let nothing happen. And oftentimes that's where some of the best ideas show up. Right, right. That that time where you can just sit and think undistracted, it's extremely important. Um... Well, your ability to do nothing is an extremely mature Thing to be able to do and i think very and trust that doing nothing is okay and then paying attention to what shows up as you're doing nothing <laughs> um, a kind of combination of those i think those things come with with wisdom and time um but extremely important so i'm, I'm wondering what what what's coming in your future what what are you excited about in the near term and the well i have the new book new books coming out so 
that's probably the last piece of work I'm going to do with, you know, with what I've come up with. So, uh, you know, that's cool. Uh, a road trip to Norway. <laughs> that's cool. Yes. And, uh, and hope- frankly, frankly, not much else other than, you know, trying to stay as healthy as I can be to, you know, to, to, you know, at age 78, trying to be not so much an, you know, I <laughs> at 78, your body's just starting to be old. So <clears throat> trying to be comfortable as I age any further, if I need to age any further, I don't really care. You know, well, I'd be fine to be out of here. You know? Well, we, well we, we'd like to have you around for, um, Say, uh, a lo- <laughs> well, uh, thanks. Yay. Uh, well, send send me good vibes. Yay. <laughs> we will. We will. Um, so sort of closing up, my, my last question and question I'd like to ask all my guests is, what in your view is, in today's world, the single most valuable idea? That it's all good. There's a reason for everything. And it's good. So relax. <laughs> and that's, that's one of the best ones yet. Simple, but very <laughs> profound in some sense. Um, well, Mr. Allen, I'd like to say it's been tremendously hey come on david mr allen my dad died years ago so (laughs) david yeah tremendously insightful and i'm and i'm very honored to have had the opportunity to dig into your amazing work and and life and and i sincerely appreciate you share your ideas thanks daniel this this is fun and always nice to meet somebody who actually bought into my stuff i never know what sticks out there for people so when i run across someone like you who's said, oh, this is cool stuff. I go, yay. (laughs) It still works. Yeah. Good. Absolute honor. Okay.